Our topic for the study today is entitled The Death Decree. In Revelation 13, we read about a beast power that would persecute God's people in the last days. Seventh-day Adventists have always identified this power as the papal power. Throughout the Dark Ages, the 1260 years of papal nomination from 538 to 1798, the papacy did dominate and did persecute, as history records. According to Revelation, the persecution will eventually lead first to a boycott, where you can neither buy nor sell. Verse 17 of Revelation 13 reads, And that no one may buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the beast or the number of his name. When boycott doesn't work, eventually a death decree will be pronounced upon those who do not submit to the power. Verse 15 tells us that he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. The great issue of contest in this last crisis is this question of the mark of the beast versus the seal of God. Persecution has often been the lot of God's people throughout history. In the Old Testament, we read about Jeremiah, who was persecuted by his own people because he prophesied that the judgments of God were coming upon the land because of their apostasy. They persecuted him terribly. Isaiah, the gospel prophet, who said more about the coming of Jesus in the first advent than any other Old Testament prophet, was eventually put inside a hollow log and sawn in two, we are told. Then we have experiences of Daniel putting, being put in the lion's den and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who were put into the fire. These stories are recorded for us in the book of Daniel. Then we have the story of Esther and the Jews of her day, when an attempt was made, instigated, of course, by Satan, who wanted to prevent the coming of the Messiah through the Jewish line, that all Jews could be killed. A real effort of mass murder or genocide, as we now call it in modern English language. Esther and the Jews were delivered from that attempt by Satan because of God's intervention. In the New Testament, we read about Peter and John before the council, Acts chapter 4. Stephen being stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. Paul persecuting the Christians, Acts chapter 9. James and Peter imprisoned, Acts chapter 12, and Paul being persecuted many times during his missionary journeys, 2 Corinthians 6, 5, and 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, I read these words for the apostle. <clears throat> Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I sometimes have wondered about that text and it has formed a bit of a challenge in my own mind because I don't find that I'm getting much persecution and so I wonder whether I'm living as godly as I should in Christ Jesus because if I did, according to this text, persecution would come. This does not mean that we should go around and ask for persecution, as some people do, and then claim that because they are being persecuted, they therefore constitute God's true people. Even the pilgrim fathers who fled from England and Europe to the New World in order to avoid persecution, persecuted each other when they arrived 
in the States. Anyone who disagreed with them was persecuted. For example, and I'm quoting now from a book by um, Murray N. Murray, Rothbard, uh, published in 1975, called The Puritans, Pacify Theocracy in Massachusetts. It's volume one, Marshes Institute, 1999. And it says this, the Puritans tyrannized not only outsiders, but also their own. They spied a sea captain kissing his wife on Sunday and locked him in the stocks. The poor guy probably hadn't seen her for months. Another unfortunate fellow fell into a pond and so skipped Sunday services to dry out his suit. They whipped him in the name of Jesus for missing church, you see. John Lewis and Sarah Chapman, two lovers, were brought to justice for what? Sitting together on the Lord's Day under an apple tree in Goodman Chapman's orchard. So even those who fled persecution persecuted others who disagreed with them or who they thought needed correction. Seventh-day Adventists know from the study of the Bible, and especially from Revelation 13 that I have already referred to, that the special point of truth that will be contested in the last days before Jesus returns will be the Sabbath Sunday issue. The seal of God versus the mark of the beast or the sign of its power. First, there will be an economic boycott, as I mentioned, against Sabbath keepers, and finally, a death decree. And I just read a few moments ago those verses. The enactment of Sunday laws will come before the close of probation, and civil penalties will soon follow. Ellen White, in early writings, page 33 to 34, wrote, I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They have not rejected the light upon it, and at the commencement of the time of trouble, that's when persecution begins, we were filled with the Holy Ghost, and we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. I developed that thought a few studies ago when I dealt with the deeper meaning of the Sabbath. But I read on the quote. This enraged the churches and nominal Adventists as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. And at this time, God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth and they came out and endured the persecution with us. I saw the sword, famine, pestilence and great confusion in the land. The wicked thought that we had brought the judgments of God upon them. And they rose up and took counsel to rid the earth of us, thinking that then the evil would be stayed. Again on pages 85 and 86, I read, the commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plagues begin to fall, but to a short period just before they are poured out, while Christ is still in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth and the nations will be angry, yet held in check, so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud cry of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. Persecution will then range, rage from the Sunday laws till God delivers his people just before the second advent. In Revelation chapter 12, 17, we read, And the dragon, Satan, was wroth with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, that is, the church in the last days. And then it identifies them by saying, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I read again Revelation 13, 15 to 17, And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, 
that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark of the beast or the number of his name. Seventh-day Adventists believe that the image of the beast will be like the beast, a religio-political power centred in the United States, represented by the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13 that came up out of the earth. And I urge you to read the chapter Revelation 13 from beginning to end to get the full picture of uh, the story and what events will develop according to this wonderful prophecy. In Revelation 17, 12 to 14, I read, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. They shall make war with the Lamb, that's Jesus, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, clearly identifying that the Lamb is Jesus. And they that are called with him are called and chosen and faithful. These horn powers represent the nations that will support the papacy in the last days. John 16 verse 2 says, They shall put you out of the synagogue. The synagogue, of course, was the Jewish place of worship, and so it mentions it by the Jewish name. And then it says, Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he is doing God's service. Early Writings, page 15. At our happy, holy state, the wicked were enraged and would rush violently up to lay hands upon us and thrust us into prison. One thing is clear that in the last days, just before Jesus comes, there will be persecution again against God's people. The prophecy declares it, so we must believe it. Will the death decree that we have read about in Scripture take place before or after the close of probation? That is a question that comes to the minds of many people. When can we expect this law to be enacted? Well, let's look first of all at evidence for the decree after the close of probation. And in early writings, 36 to 37, Ellen White wrote, I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary, that is, the close of probation and after. And then will come the seven last plagues. So clearly the seven last plagues will come and to fall upon human beings after the close of probation. Then she wrote further, these plagues enraged the wicked against the righteous. They thought that we had brought the judgments of God upon them and that if they would rid the earth of us, the plagues would then be stayed or removed. A decree went forth to slay the saints, which caused them to cry day and night for deliverance. On the basis of this evidence, it is believed by many that the death decree will come after the close of probation because it is clear the seven last plagues fall after the close of probation. However, there is much evidence to support the belief that there is a death decree, at least of some kind, before the close of probation. This apparent contradiction can be easily resolved by accepting that there will be a death decree both before and after the close of probation. Now we will look first of all at the Bible evidence for a decree before the close of probation. So the next heading of our subject is evidence for a death decree before the close of probation. And I turn to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, and it reads like this. And I saw those, the souls of those who were beheaded, that is executed, for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. 
This verse in Revelation clearly tells us that there will be some martyrs before the close of probation when the mark of the beast is being enforced. Therefore, there must be some law or decree before the close of probation under which they are sentenced to death and executed because the verse says he saw those who had been executed for refusing the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast test will come before the close of probation for it is the test that God's people will have to face before they are sealed and the sealing clearly takes place before the close of probation. In the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 976, Ellen White wrote, The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. For it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. And the sealing work is to be completed before the close of probation. Therefore, there is to be this death test before the close of probation. Sin has told us, in at least, she has told us that in, at least in two places that there will be no martyrs after the close of probation. That is good news. Because if we're martyred after the close of probation, she said it would only be a triumph for Satan. It would not do any good or bring any others to conversion. Because the Spirit of God is no longer working upon the, those who have re rejected him. <clears throat> this is the test, she says, that the people of God must have before they are sealed. <clears throat> the death of the, any martyr after the close of probation would be too late to influence anyone towards accepting God's truth. And God would not allow the wicked to kill his sealed saints at that time. Early writings, page 284, she wrote, God would not suffer or allow the wicked to destroy those who were expecting translation and who would not bow to the decree of the beast or receive his mark. I saw that if the wicked were permitted to slay the saints, Satan and all his hosts, all who hate God would be gratified. And in Great Controversy 634, she says, if the blood of Christ's faithful witnesses were shed at this time, it would not, like the blood of the martyrs, referring to the Middle Ages, be as seed sown to yield a harvest for God. Since there will be no martyrs after the close of probation, there has to be a decree of some kind before the close of probation in order for Revelation 20 verse 4 to be fulfilled and to be meaningful. This verse tells us, as we read just a moment ago, that there would be those who would be martyred because they refused to worship the beast and receive his mark. Thus we can see that there is clear evidence from the writings of the Bible and the writings of Ellen White that there will be a death decree before the close of probation. It is also supported by some following quotations which I have gathered together and I'll present them to you now. Ellen White writing in Testimonies for the Church, volume 9, page 230, said, But those who forsake God to save their lives will be forsaken by him. In seeking to save their lives by yielding the truth, they will lose eternal life. According to Revelation chapter 22, no one can change sides after the close of probation. For Jesus has uttered those famous words, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. No one changes sides after the close of probation. It's too late for the wicked to repent and it's too late for a righteous person to apostatize and turn his back on God. He's sealed and sealed for eternity. In Prophets and Kings, page 188, 189, I read these words. 
Though who, those who have yielded step by step to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will then yield to the powers that be rather than submit themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. At that time, the gold will be separated from the dross, many a star that we have admired, for its brilliance will then go out in total darkness. So people are changing sides when this test comes. Therefore, the test comes before the close of probation. That means there is a death threat, a death test of some kind before the close of probation. Ellen White had a very interesting vision given to her by God. A vision of Satan holding a committee meeting with his evil angels. And she wrote it up in the book, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 472, 473. Interesting to see a glimpse of Satan's modus operandi, as we say, his method of operation and what he will be doing in the test in these last days. Let me quote it to you. Says the great deceiver, now these are the words of Satan to his evil angels, we must watch those who are calling the attention of the people to the Sabbath of Jehovah. They will lead many to see the claims of the law of God and the same light which reveals the true Sabbath reveals also the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and shows that the last work for man's salvation is now going forward. Hold fast the minds in darkness till the work is ended and we shall secure the world and the church too. The Sabbath is the great question that is to decide the destiny of souls. We must exalt the Sabbath of our creating. We have caused it to be accepted by both worldlings and church members. Now the church must be led to unite with the world in its support. We must work by signs and wonders to blind the eyes to the truth and lead them to lay aside reason and the fear of God and follow custom and tradition. I will influence popular ministers to turn the attention of their hearers from the commandments of God. That which the scriptures declare to be a perfect law of liberty shall be presented as a yoke of bondage. How often we hear those words. The people accept their ministers' explanations of scripture and do not investigate for themselves. Therefore, by working through the ministers, Satan says, I can control the people according to my will. But our principal concern is to silence this sect of Sabbath keepers. We must excite popular indignation against them. We will enlist great men, worldly wise men upon our side, and influence those in authority to carry out our purposes. Then the Sabbath that I have set up shall be enforced by laws the most severe and exacting. Those who disregard them shall be driven out from the cities and villages and made to suffer hunger and privation. When once we have the power, we will show what we can do with those who do not serve do not swerve from their allegiance to God. We led the Romish church to inflict imprisonment, torture and death upon those who refused to yield to her decrees and now we are bringing the Protestant churches and the world into harmony with this right arm of our strength. We will finally have a law to exterminate all who will not submit to our authority. When death shall be made the penalty for violating our Sabbath then many who are now ranked with the commandment keepers will come over to our side. Emphasis there has been supplied. So you see, the threat of death will cause many who are not completely surrendered to God to give up their faith. It must happen before the close of probation because he stressed before, no one changes sides after the close of probation. When death shall be made the penalty of violating our Sabbath, Satan said, then many who are now ranked with the commandment keepers will come over to our side. 
Christ Object Lessons, page 412. It is in a crisis that character is revealed. So now, a sudden and unlooked-for calamity, something that brings the soul face to face with death, will show if there is any real faith in the promises of God. The great final test comes at the close of human probation when it will be too late for the soul's need to be supplied. It is therefore clear that the sealing takes place before the close of probation, so this death threat is also prior to the close of probation. The, these quotations that I have just read to you clearly show that Ellen White taught that there would be a death decree before the close of probation. For under this death threat, some will depart from the faith. It is clear from Revelation chapter 22, verse 13, that no one changes sides after probation closes. However, we have already seen above that the wicked blame the righteous for the seven last plagues <coughs> and pass a second death decree against them thinking that if they rid the earth of Sabbath keepers, then they think that God would then withdraw the plagues that he had sent. This parallels the attempt by Satan to exterminate God's people back in the days of Queen Esther, we referred to a little while ago. How can this apparent contradiction be harmonized? The answer appears to be that there are two death decrees or death threats. The first is before the close of probation, which we have been told is the test that God's people must face before they can be sealed. Under this death penalty, there will be martyrs, as we have seen from Revelation 18, verse 4. <clears throat> it may be that under this death law, there will be those who are arrested, sentenced to death by courts, judgment, and maybe even by juries, but after the close of probation, when the seven last plagues are falling, the wicked become so enraged that they pass a second law, allowing anyone who finds a Sabbath keeper to be allowed after a certain date that is set to carry out the death penalty themselves without retribution. This appears to be the picture, according to the final quote from Great Controversy in page 631. She wrote, Though a general decree has fixed the time when God's commandment keepers may be put to death, their enemies will in some cases anticipate the decree and before the time specified will endeavour to take their lives. But none can pass the mighty guardians stationed about every faithful soul. Some are assailed in their flight from the cities and villages, but the swords raised against them break and fall as straw. Others are defended by angels in the form of men of war. Here were angels will appear, apparently, according to this prophecy, as soldiers who will defend God's people at that time. The next setting I want to discuss is entitled, God Delivers His People. God has promised to deliver his people in this last great final crisis. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, we read, At that time shall Michael stand up. Michael the archangel is a title of Christ. That standing up is the close of probation. And then the verse goes on to say, And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at thy time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. What a wonderful promise that is for God's faithful people at that time. Jeremiah 30 verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. This time of trouble called the time of Jacob's trouble, is the time that lasts from the close of probation until God delivers his people by announcing the time and the hour of the second coming. When he does this, the righteous understand the announcement and are encouraged 
But the wicked do not understand it. They think that it has just thundered. At that time, the wicked have ever come to understand that they have been fighting against God and they turn on their leaders who have deceived them. I read this now in the book Great Controversies, 635, 652. And may I suggest before I read it that if you haven't read this wonderful book, you ought to get a hold of a copy of it and read it because the last half of the book particularly deals with the subject that we're talking about in these last days. Let me read the quote. There's a full description here of the time of Jacob's trouble, and it tells us how God will deliver his people. In fact, you can read two chapters that are relevant here. One chapter is the great controversy entitled The Time of Trouble, and the second chapter is entitled God's People Delivered. I recommend the reading of those two chapters in the book because it will picture for you in greater detail how God will step in and deliver his people just before the second coming of Jesus by announcing the day and the hour of his coming and encouraging his people to hold to their faith because he is on his way and the wicked sense that they have been deceived and they have been fighting the wrong cause and supporting the wrong power and they then turn on their leaders who have deceived them. And Ellen White has told us, great will be their anguish of soul when they realize that they are finally lost. But we who know the truth and honor and serve God will look up when Jesus comes and say, lo, this is our God, we have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. In a later chapter, I'm going to deal more specifically with the teaching of the second advent of Jesus and what it will be like. May God grant all of us will be there at that day. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.